We have a very special guest this morning. Uh, uh, one of those people I would drive a long ways just to hear her speak, and I uh, have over the years. Uh, Johnny Erickson Tata will be uh, taking up the whole chapel, and you'll, you'll be glad that we gave her the whole chapel to do this. Before she comes, I want to say a prayer, and then we're going to see a video that will introduce you to uh, Johnny and friends, and what she is, and what she does, and who she works with. But Father in heaven, thank you that we can gather in the name of your Son. We can enjoy the fellowship, the communion of your saints. Thank you for Johnny and for Ken and for their work. Lord, uh, meet with us this hour. Be pleased with the things we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. A warm summer afternoon in 1967, a 17-year-old goes swimming with her sister on the Chesapeake Bay and just swims right out to this raft anchored a few yards offshore, pulls herself up onto it, takes this stupid dive into very shallow water. Johnny! I knew right then and there that, um, boy, my life had changed forever. My doctor said, Johnny, you are going to be paralyzed for the rest of your life without use of your hands or your legs. God, I can't live like this. I will not live this way. Because I couldn't hold razors or push pills down my throat, I knew I couldn't end my life physically. So I was strongly tempted to end my life emotionally, mentally, spiritually. I was strongly tempted to just lay in bed, turn on the air conditioner, tell my mother to turn out the lights, and just shut the door. Finally, in that darkness behind that closed door, I realized I can't live like this. God, show me how to live. My only anchor was the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and everything give thanks. And like a suction cup, I just pressed myself up against that verse, okay, God, I am going to give thanks today. Small things, small steps, moving forward one bit at a time. And oh my goodness, as I exercise this little bit of obedience and giving thanks, my face stretches, it grows, my perspective widens, the world gets bigger as I take bigger steps and thank God for more things, greater things, and life begins to change. And that was a wonderful day when I opened the door and wheeled out of that dark bedroom and began to embrace life. I discovered that there are an awful lot of other disabled people in dark bedrooms who need to embrace life. And I've got a wonderful team of people at Johnny and Friends who are helping them to do just that. Because if there's a church in their area that needs to reach out to a family with a disability, then hey, we at Johnny and Friends will help them. Or if there's a family in a community, a, a mom and dad whose marriage is breaking apart because of a disabled kid, then we'll scholarship them. We'll send them to a family retreat. Or if there's a nursing home and folks are languishing without hope and feeling despair, then we'll send them special delivery. We'll give them Bibles. We'll give them the love of God. Or, or maybe if they can only reach so far as to turn a radio knob on their bedside table, then they can listen to the Johnny and Friends radio program. Or if there's a child in Albania who doesn't have a wheelchair, or a grandmother in Guatemala who's being pushed around in a wheelbarrow, then we will give them a wheelchair. We'll give them a Bible. That's our passionate Johnny and Friends. To embrace life means to embrace Christ and to embrace the circumstances he puts us in. And I want to share that message, whether through speaking or singing, writing, painting, you name it. You give me somebody, anybody, and I will tell them that God's power can show up best in their weakness, too. Good morning, everybody, and thanks so much for that warm welcome. And since introductions are being made, let me quick introduce my wonderful husband, and we just celebrated 30 years of marriage, Ken Tata. And I want to thank uh, uh, Ben Patterson and, of course, Gail Beebe and, and, uh, and Joel and all the rest who have made us feel so warm and welcome, part of the Westmont College community. And I tell you what, Driving up the hill this morning, I'm thinking to myself, what in the world can I say to these students? Here I am, paralyzed 45 years, 
in a wheelchair, no use of my hands or my legs, dealing daily with chronic pain, having just completed a battle against stage three breast cancer. But I think you friends can identify with suffering. I think you can. Because hardships, questions for God, why does he allow such awful things to happen? These questions come at us in all shapes and sizes. And there's not a student here today who hasn't gone through tough times and wondered, God, are you there? What gives? When I broke my neck in that diving accident so many years ago, facing the prospect of sitting down for the rest of my life, I asked the same questions that I'm sure you would have asked. Now, you got to understand, I was a Christian. But in the hospital, I would lie awake at night till one, two in the morning, trying to understand what in the world the Lord was doing. I mean, like you, I knew the scriptures. I knew that James chapter one said to welcome this trial as a friend. And I knew that Romans chapter five told me to quote, rejoice in this suffering. And Philippians chapter one had told me that it had been granted to me, that is given to me, not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. And Acts chapter 14 reminded me that we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And then there was Romans 8, 28. I mean, that really suited well when I was sweating out 25 laps on the field hockey uh, field, but lying in bed paralyzed, this was just too much. Quadriplegia was too much. And I felt like gagging on those Bible verses. Maybe you felt the same. Which is odd because I thought before my diving accident that I had God all figured out, neat, tidy, in a little box. I had the answers. But now, lying in that hospital bed, I had big questions. I was near to throwing in the towel, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. But one night, and I was in a six-bed ward in this hospital, I was in the corner bed by the window, one night when I could not sleep, and mind you, I didn't want to cry because I couldn't wipe my nose or dry my eyes, and bad enough being a quadriplegic without being a messy quadriplegic, and, and, and so I'd sniff back the tears, and, and I would just wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord God, what are you doing one night around 2 a.m. while my roommates were asleep? I turned my head on the pillow, and I looked toward the open door of the ward. Now, the nurses were on break, but there was a soft light coming in from the nurse's station, and I look up, and suddenly there's a figure standing in the doorway. And this figure gets down on its hands and knees and begins crawling into our bedroom. Past my roommates who were sleeping and crawling toward my corner of the room, I start to panic. Who is this? Well, this figure got close to the hospital bed and, and, and peered through the guardrail, and I saw immediately, oh, it's my girlfriend Jackie, it's my high school girlfriend. It's Jackie, the girl with whom I share milkshakes, boyfriends, hockey sticks. And I tell her, Jackie, if they catch you here, they're gonna kick you out of here. To which she replies, shh, stands up, gently lowers the guardrail of my hospital bed, and then just like high school kids will do at a pajama sleepover, she, she just crawled into bed with me in the dark, snuggled up next to me, put her head on my pillow, and she reached down and grabbed my hand, and I could not feel it, but she raised it way in the air, straight up like an obelisk. And I'm looking straight up at her arms intertwined together. And she turns her head to me, and in my ear begins to softly sing. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim, hallelujah, what a savior. 
And I don't know how to describe it even to this day, but something changed. Something she did, something that overruled all my questions, which is odd because that night I did not get any answers. But suddenly the questions did not seem as urgent. And I think, looking back, I think that when suffering hits us hard and questions about God come, God's got his reasons, and they are good, no doubt about that. But I will be the first to tell you, looking back on those Bible verses, that when your heart is being wrung out like a sponge, an orderly list of the 16 good biblical reasons as to why all this has happened, it can sting like, like salt in a wound. Because when you're hurting, you don't stop the bleeding with answers, no. Answers don't always reach the problem where it hurts. And that's in the gut and in the heart. When I think a person is, when a person is suffering, I think it's a little like this. When I was a kid, I rode a bicycle down the hill and I was going fast and I turned the, the corner and gravel hit my front wheel. My bike spun out. I fell to the ground. My knee is scraped. It starts bleeding. My daddy comes running. I look up, holding my bloody knee, screaming, Daddy, why? Why? Now, how cruel it would have been if my father had approached me and stood over me and folded his arms and said, well, that's a very good question. Let me give you the answer to that. You were going too fast down that hill. Next time, watch the trajectory of your turn. Be observant of gravel. That would have been a great answer to my question, why? But that's not what I wanted. What I wanted was daddy to reach down and pick me up and press me against his chest and pat me on the back and say, there, there, sweetheart, it's okay, daddy's here, it's okay. That's what we want. Because when people get a bad medical report or there's the birth of a child with multiple disabilities or someone sustains a life-altering injury or someone is taken in a horrible automobile accident, those remaining, their heartfelt plea is for, is for assurance. Someone who will be next to them to say, I'm here, I understand, I'm with you, I get it, that's what we want. That's what Jackie gave me that night. What's more, we want assurance. We want a fatherly assurance that everything's okay. Daddy's here, it's okay. We want an order to our reality that far transcends our pain and our problems. We want to know that the world is not splitting apart at the seams and it's not spinning out of control in nightmarish chaos. We want things to be orderly and stable and we want to know that somehow everything will turn out okay. We want God to be that daddy. We want God to be at the center of things, at the center of our suffering. What's more, he must be consummately good. He must be daddy, personal and warm and compassionate. And that's our cry. And guess what? God, just like a good daddy, isn't quick to give advice. He's not real quick to give even answers, but he will give himself. In Psalm 18, he gives himself as a mighty fortress to those who are feeling weak and infirmed. And in Psalm 10, he gives himself as the father to the orphaned. And in Isaiah 62, he becomes the bridegroom to the single parent of a disabled kid who's lonely and fearful. And in Exodus 15, he becomes the healer to the sick. In Isaiah 9, he becomes the wonderful counselor to the person who is manic depressive or confused. There were many nights after my friend Jackie left, many nights when I was still tempted in that hospital to feel panicky, claustrophobic, scared of my future. But instead of panicking, I would turn my head on the pillow and look toward the open doorway and imagine Jesus. I just pictured him coming into my hospital room, dressed in a rough burlap cloak, rope belt, come walking up to my bedroom, 
bedside and taken the guardrail and gently, quietly lowering it, and then sitting on the edge of my hospital mattress, and then just reaching out, touching my cheek with the backside of his hand, Johnny, if I loved you enough to die for you, then don't you think I'm worthy of your trust? Wow. God's word gives us life-changing truth, no doubt about that. But it's God's people who give the life-changing compassion. And that's what Jackie gave me that night. She made Jesus real, simply by being there and drawing near and in as much by her presence saying, I'm here, I'm with you, I understand, I get it. And she pointed me to my rescuer, my deliverer. I want to get this arm behind me, Catherine. I'm so sorry. 45 years in a wheelchair and I get kind of stiff and I can't even move. Oh, thank you. She pointed me to my rescuer and my deliverer and my savior. Jackie made the man of sorrows suddenly become the Lord of joy. Proof that I changed was just maybe six or eight months after I got out of the hospital. And Jackie and my same high school friends came by one Friday night. And uh, they asked my mom and dad if we could go out. That was fine. They were a little nervous. There were no seat belts on the fronts of Camaros back then. They threw me into the front seat of the Camaro. Absolutely no seat belts. And we go zooming down the road into the interior of Baltimore City. And my friends and I all get out at the Pennsylvania Railroad Station, a big, beautiful, marble railroad station with high ceilings. And they wheeled me inside. It was around 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. Nobody was around. A couple of sailors waiting for a train, a janitor or two mopping up. This cavernous hall with high ceilings. And we began to sing. Man of sorrows, what a name. And oh my goodness, the sound just echoed off the ceiling. We kept singing until one of the railway station guards came up to us and looked at his watch and said, you kids, get out of here. It's too late. Come on, get out of here. And you, you in that wheelchair, you put it back where you found it. <laughs> and I said, well, sir, this is my wheelchair. Don't you give me any lip, missy. You put that thing back where you found it and get out of here. And I insisted, but it's my wheelchair. Well, at that point, he turned red with embarrassment. Okay, okay, but just, just get on, get going. And we all laughed all the way home. And I realized for the first time, I called it my wheelchair. I knew something fundamentally had changed inside of me when I was able to embrace my daddy feel the pat on his back and say, this is my experience, this is my pain, and it's my wheelchair, and Jesus is my savior. Hurting people aren't so much looking for answers as the warm and reviving touch of Christ. Sometimes though, we Christians, we offer help to hurting people as though slapping a, a, a pint of blood on the counter like here, here you go, here's life-giving truth. Here, welcome this trial as a friend. Rejoice in suffering. Attend this support group. Come to this Bible, Bible study. Take this truth. Swallow it. Ingest it. Believe it. You'll feel better. But never, ever should we separate the God of the Bible from the Bible's answers. Helping somebody like me? God asks us to Hook our veins up to that person who is hemorrhaging human strength. Because we show Christian love when we pour our heart out into another's life, as though giving a spiritual transfusion, warm and personal, reviving and life-giving. That's what Christian compassion means. Compassion, come means with, passion means suffering, with suffering. When we reach out in compassion to somebody, we're reaching out into their suffering. And to serve someone like me with my disability is to, as Thomas Merton put it, is to pour out love like wine as strong as fire. That's why Jackie was able to make Jesus Christ so real to me that night. 
The world is full of so much hopelessness, so much suffering. It's bleeding out of control. And suffering can either drive people to God or drive them away from God. Suffering is one of those things that has great potential for good, but also great potential for harm. Like the same match that barbecues a juicy steak will be the same match that sets a forest on fire. But God wants to use suffering to drive people to him. Suffering is like an alarm clock. It's like red lights blinking, yellow lights waving. It's like, doo -doo 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 -doo. what about you? What have you done with your eternity? What will happen to you on the other side of your tombstone? Suffering kind of is God's way of waking us up, getting us out of our spiritual slumber with an ice cold splash of hardship in the face. And when we are hit hard with suffering, yes, we've got big questions, but God is bigger still. And acts of compassion, those up close and personal, I am with you, way of ministering, that's what will drive people to God in the midst of their affliction, not away from him. When people are hurting, his church, and I mean, who else is there, right? It's just you and me. His church is the agent of comfort and mercy and grace and encouragement, showing, not just telling people, but showing them his love, not just declaring, but demonstrating it, not just proclaiming it, but portraying it, helping them to experience being pressed up against the breast of God to feel that pat pat on the back and the fatherly assurance that it's okay. I tell you what, the prosperity gospel, that health wealth gospel, that doesn't speak to people like me. It doesn't even skate on the surface of our needs. Maybe the health wealth gospel placates some and lulls them into some sleepy spiritual stupor, but it won't satisfy those who are afflicted in the gut in the heart and in the body. Maybe hearing that um, Jesus came to be your best buddy. That will appease some, but it will be, it'll be bitterness to those who are truly suffering. People who are hurting need to experience the truth of the rugged, robust gospel that redeems their suffering and touches them at their deepest point of need. Surely your spiritual instincts tell you this. And you don't have to have quadriplegia like me. You don't have to even have a brother with autism. You don't even have to have a mother with multiple sclerosis or a grandparent with Alzheimer's. Suffering should drive us to God, not away from him. It's something I experience every morning. 90% of the time when I get up in the morning, because please don't be thinking I'm a professional at this quadriplegia thing. 45 years has not made me an expert. I'm no veteran. When I get up in the morning, I can hear my girlfriend in the kitchen running water for coffee. I know she's going to be coming into my bedroom in a few moments with a cheery, happy hello. And I'm lying in bed thinking, I can't do this. I just can't do this one more day. Oh, Father, I cannot bear the thought of one more person coming into my bedroom and giving me a bed bath, doing my toileting routine, stretching my arms, stretching my legs, getting me dressed, strapping on my corset, hiking me into the wheelchair, pushing me to the bathroom, brushing my teeth, blowing my nose. Oh, God, I have no, I'm so weary. I, I can't face this. I cannot do quadriplegia, but I can do all things through you. As you strengthen me, I have no resources for this day, but you do. I have no strength for this day, but you do. I have no smile for this girl who's going to be coming into my bedroom with that hot cup of coffee, but you do. So please give me your smile. I need you desperately. And I tell you what, by 7.35 in the morning when my girlfriend does come into the bedroom to start my routines, I have a smile for her, and it's mine, and it's been hard fought for, hard won, sent straight from heaven. 
And I venture to say that the really handicapped people are the ones who, when their alarm clock goes off in the morning, they hit it hard, throw back the covers, jump out of bed, take a quick shower, scarf down breakfast, maybe give God a speedy tip of the hat of a quiet time for 10 minutes, and then they're zooming out the front door on automatic cruise control. Did you know that if you live like this, like that, God is against you? If you live like that, God resists you. It says in James chapter 1, verse 4, God resists the proud. James chapter 4, verse 1, he resists the proud. He's against the proud. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace, grace to the humble. And who are the humble? Just people like you and me who daily recognize our desperate need of God. Just people like you and me who have allowed their suffering to drive them to God rather than away from him. I remember when I was on a Wheels for the World team, Johnny and Friends delivers wheelchairs and Bibles around the world to needy disabled people. There's a need for about 18 million wheelchairs around the world and there are one billion people with disabilities in the world, 80% of them live in developing nations. I remember we went to West Africa and I met a disabled man who came to our wheelchair distribution dragging himself by his hands with his legs behind him and then he gathered himself up, sat back on his haunches, saw me and spread wide his arms and said, oh Johnny, welcome to our country where God is so much bigger and he's bigger because we need him more. God always seems bigger to those who need him most. God always seems bigger to those who feel that pat pat on the back. God always seems bigger to those who allow suffering to drive them to God rather than away from him. And no one needs God more than people with disabilities like me. Oh my goodness. That's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, go out. Find the disabled, the lame, and the blind and bring them in. I mean, nowhere else does God get that specific about who he wants to give his reviving, warm, and personal touch to than people with disabilities. And he, I'm sorry, Kathy, got to get that hand behind me again. And he does this. He does this because he likes to be around people with disabilities. He enjoys it. He says in the 23rd verse in that same chapter in Luke 14, do this so that my father's house might be full. And all it takes is just a, a, a quick look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Jesus is constantly hanging out with people with handicapping conditions like me. On every page of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's reserving his most gentle touch for the blind. He's striking up conversations with paralyzed people on straw mats by the pool of Bethesda. He's answering the, father, the, the questions of fathers of little boys with seizures. And friend, you can do the same to the people who are hurting in your life, for the people around you who are questioning God, especially if you know someone with a disability. Now, I don't mean climbing into a hospital bed with somebody like Jackie once climbed into bed with me, though who knows? I mean, there are all kinds of ways that you can reach out to people who are hurting. Johnny and Friends has myriad numbers of programs for you to get plugged into right away. We have internship programs. We have something that we call our Cause for Life Ministry and Missions Academy. It's designed to educate and train, activate your generation for the work of ministry, global missions, justice, and advocacy for children and adults affected by disability. It's an eight-week internship that we hold and it's a life-changing experience. It includes classes and lectures with disability experts, hands-on practical service at one of our Johnny and Friends family retreats, 
You'll intern at our International Disability Center. There'll be local church ministry opportunities among special needs families, and even a mission outreach to disabled people in Haiti. Our Christian Institute on Disability also has an online study course called Beyond Suffering. I'm gonna to introduce to you Steve Bundy. Would you stand up, Steve? Would you welcome him? Please, this is our director. Steve is the director of our Christian Institute on Disability down at the International Disability Center. And we have an online course called Beyond Suffering. Please, if you have any questions about it, if you'd like to learn more about plugging into helping people with disabilities, like Jackie once helped me, then Steve's the guy you want to talk to. Or you can volunteer at any one of our 25 family retreats across the United States this summer. We will also have 15 family retreats in developing nations. Four of those U.S. family retreats will be held right here in California, and it will be an opportunity to provide hands-on practical service so that you can demonstrate that compassion that I was talking about earlier. And if you're still wondering about your major, then think about, think about special needs, perhaps special education, or perhaps rec therapy, occupational or physical therapy. But even if your major is something else, if you're a business major, hey, remember, one day hire the handicapped, okay? <laughs> there are all kinds of ways that you can help. And I look back, and I thank God that my friend Jackie had Christian compassion, as well as the courage to give the touch of Jesus Christ. Did my questions finally get answered? A lot of them did, but a lot of them didn't. I tend to think that when tragedy happens, it's like God has upset the table with the puzzle on it, and all the pieces go flying. And then some day, sometimes after a tragedy, you think it's your, you, 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 you just gotta stay sane, you gotta stay mentally together, and so you go scrambling, looking for all the puzzle pieces, hoping you'll find them, and then you try to desperately fit them together so life will make sense, so that God will make sense. And you look under the couch, and you look under the chairs, and you find as many puzzle pieces as you can, and you start trying to put back the puzzle together, and sometimes you can, but most often you can't put the puzzle together. Because on this side of eternity, we don't always find all the puzzle pieces. And life doesn't always make sense. Sometimes neither does God. But real wisdom is not the ability to find all the puzzle pieces and put them back together so everything looks good and is neat and tidy and orderly. Real wisdom is trusting God even when the puzzle pieces go missing. Real wisdom is trusting God even when life does not make sense. Because one day, one day he will give us the key which will unlock the seemingly senseless suffering down here on earth. John Piper once said, and I love this quote, every day in every circumstance, in every situation, God is doing more than a thousand things that we cannot see or know. And one day he will give us that key that will show us those thousand things. And one day all the puzzle pieces will fit and it will make sense. And I can't wait for that day. Oh my goodness, I am so looking forward to that day when God will close the curtain on sin and sorrow and suffering and death and disease and disability. Oh my goodness, with my new glorified body, I'm gonna jump up, dance, kick, do aerobics. I'm gonna be so excited. <laughs> and you know what I wanna do in heaven? I hope that I can take this wheelchair with me. Now, I know that's not theologically correct, but if I could, I would put it right over there, 
And then here I would be standing up on my resurrected legs, grateful, glorified knees, standing right next to Jesus. I would hold his hand. I would feel those nail scars in his palm. And I would say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And I know that he will know that I mean it because I know he'll recognize me as the one who hemorrhaged human strength when I was on earth. I was the one who came to him every morning. I can't do this thing called life. My puzzle pieces aren't fitting together. And he'll recognize me and he'll, he'll see that poor power had been poured out from him every morning into my life so that I might face the day with courage and confidence in him. He'll recognize me. And I pray for that day when I might hear those good words, well done, Johnny, good job. You trusted me. And man, you didn't have a lot of puzzle pieces. I will be so happy. I will be so glad and I will say, Lord Jesus, thank you. For the weaker I was, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. And see that wheelchair over there? It was the very instrument you used to push me up into your arms, to press me against your breast so that I might feel the fatherly pat pat on my back. Thank you, Jesus. Every morning you drove me to yourself using that wheelchair. And now, if you would be so kind, please send it to hell. <laughs> Won't that be fun? That's gonna be such a great day. Can't wait. There are people in the world where the kingdom is very weak. There are plenty of parts of the world where the kingdom is so weak. And it really is bleeding out of control. Where children with disabilities, 97% of them are abused, locked in sheds, in cupboards, while their mothers and fathers go into the field to work all day, they lie in the dark, hour after hour, no food, no water. I think my suffering's bad. I think my puzzle pieces don't fit. Oh my goodness. The rest of the world needs you. The rest of the world needs you. Big time. Hugely. The rest of the world needs you. And you can make a difference. This is why God has brought you to Westmont, to prepare you for the sort of compassionate Christian service that I have been talking about all morning. And I promise your life will never, ever be the same. You want to see how differently your life can be? I want to show you the video of a friend of mine. Her name is Jasmine. She was very young when she got involved in our ministry at Johnny and Friends. But once she got involved in disability ministry through our work, you will be amazed at how her life changed. Just take a look. My name is Jasmine Tell, and I have six siblings with disabilities. My oldest sister was born with spina bifida. And because of her, my parents decided to begin adopting children with special needs. They adopted my brother, Joey, and he was born with the birth defect spine bifida. In 2008, we came to family retreat um, with him, and he absolutely loved it. It was the most amazing experience for him. Joey had this really awesome STM, short-term missionary assigned to him, whose name was Clay. And he just really had an awesome time with Joey and really blessed Joey's time here at Family Retreat. Joey felt like an incredible star the whole week and everybody just commented on his amazing smile and how much fun he was having. After Family Retreat, Joey had a semi-routine dental surgery done and we didn't realize it, but during that surgery, his esophagus was punctured and fluid ended up leaking into his chest cavity. He was in the hospital for about six weeks, just had a really, really difficult hospitalization, and yet um, he just stayed really upbeat the whole time. And throughout that, I mean, my family, because of my siblings with disability, they had spent a lot of time in hospitals over the years and really had 
very little support during those times. You know, we never got cards. We never had people check in. And during Joey's hospitalization, he must have gotten mail every single day from people who had been at family retreat. And by the time he was released from the hospital, his entire hospital room was covered in cards and pictures and just uh, gifts from people that he had met at family retreat. Um, so we got to come home for six days. And on the sixth day, we, um, we found him unconscious in his room. And he was pronounced dead at the hospital because he had gone into septic shock. When something like that happens, that's when you really see the face of God. And I saw God during those weeks that followed. They were horrible and yet beautiful. Primarily because of the people that had become our family through Johnny and friends in a family retreat. We had people drive six hours to be with our family. We had people fly to be with our family. And we had cards and phone calls and so much love that carried us through that. And I knew pretty soon, I think within a week after Joey's death, that God wanted me to take his wheelchair and take it to Thailand on a Wheels for the World um, distribution. Wheels for the World takes wheelchairs and refurbishes them in prisons and then distributes them in different countries. And I had been on several of their trips already. And we loaded up and I took that wheelchair with all my preconceived notions of who it should go to. And the days just kept passing. And I was just going, okay, God, you know, the trip's almost over and this wheelchair hasn't been given away. I'm gonna have to take this back to America. And the second to the last day, one of my teammates came up and said, I think we have the person that's gonna take your brother's chair. And I walked over and I saw Song Pong, who was a very petite, 31-year-old Thai woman affected by polio. And as soon as I saw her, I knew she was gonna have Joey's wheelchair because she had the exact same smile and light in her eyes that Joey had had. And as I sat there, I got to be there as she prayed and accepted Christ as her savior because of what she saw in God bringing her this wheelchair. Um, because of that trip, the next year, I decided that I, I had to go back to Thailand. And I signed up and I went and I met this guy and he was passionate about disability ministry, uh, passionate about all the same things I was. And um, we started corresponding. Um, he came to the United States and we spent a lot of time together. He came to family retreat and got to see my world in America. And we, um, we got married. And the day after we got married, we flew to Thailand and began working with a disability ministry that partners with Johnny and Friends. Um, we have a little baby girl. And my husband's name is Joey. And I can't thank Johnny and Friends enough for how they have changed my life and been there for me and all that they've done. If you want more information or if you don't have a class breathing down your neck in the last next 10 or 15 minutes, then please see Steve Bundy up here. Uh, wave your hand again, Steve. Steve is the one to talk with if you'd like to get plugged into our internships, if you'd like to find out more about our family retreats, if you'd like to take our online course called Beyond Suffering. Please know that God wrote the book on suffering. He knows all about it. And he named it Jesus. And I want you to help someone, like Jackie once helped me, see that the man of sorrows can also be their Lord of joy. It's all about making Jesus real. 
to those who need him most. And you don't have to break your neck to do it. God bless you. Thank you for listening. And you're dismissed. <laughs>